Hi, everyone. Welcome to the SAEM Research Learning Series course online lecture titled, How Qualitative Methods Can Help You Succeed in Research. This presentation is being recorded and will be available shortly following today's session. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Elizabeth Schoenfeld and Dr. McKinney Chisholm Staker. Dr. Schoenfeld is an assistant professor at the Department of Emergency Medicine Institute for Healthcare Delivery and Population Services at UMass Medical School, Bay State. She received qualitative training through the International Institute for Qualitative Methodology, a master's in clinical and translational science and training with her mentor and expert in qualitative methods. She has been funded by both an R03 and a K08 for studies using qualitative methods. She has published multiple papers based on her qualitative studies, as well as numerous papers derived from the questions explored during qualitative inquiry. Dr. Chisholm Staker is a research faculty member at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She received qualitative and quantitative training through completion of a master's in public health at Columbia University and has received federal and foundational grant support. Working with and within invisible populations, Dr. Chisholm Staker has published original work using qualitative and quantitative methods to, be, to better understand the needs of and appropriate interventions for labor and sex trafficked persons, homeless youth, transgender and gender non-conforming individuals, and unaccompanied and separated minors. Dr. Chisholm Staker Straker finds qualitative investigatory methods particularly useful. Dr. Schoenfeld and Chisholm Staker, I will now turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we're gonna go through uh, why you use qualitative methods and how to use qualitative methods. Um, we're gonna give a brief introduction to our own research so you can get a little bit of background on us. Um, my use of qualitative methods has been going on for about six years now and originally really focused around shared decision-making and uh, perspectives on shared decision-making of both patients and physicians um, in the emergency department. And more recently, my qualitative methods have actually focused on opiate use disorder and the treatment of opiate use disorder in the emergency room, both uh, providers' perspectives as well as patients' perspectives. Um, Dr. Chisholm Straker. Thanks. Um... So you've heard a little bit already in the introduction about uh, the ways, that the populations in which I have used qualitative research. Um, in the past, um, I started out with looking at trans and gender queer experiences in emergency departments, uh, specifically in the United States. Um, and so I find that qualitative uh, research actually provides a rich foundation uh, for moving forward in research and what the right directions are to go in next. Um, currently, I have a few qualitative projects going. Uh, one of them is actually looking at the uh, impact of the public charge expansion in immigrant communities. Um, and these are, I think, uh, sort of very rich and, and interesting ways to find out what else do we need to be studying are the interventions that you know we're using, do policies work and how do they actually impact folks more than just numbers that sometimes don't give you the whole story, but we'll get into it a little bit more. All right, we want to give you um, a little bit more in terms of resources. Um, and so these notes will be on the SAM webpage so you can grab them and take a look at them. Um, but, but basically there are some books, there are some primary articles, and there are some references that you really need to understand and you may need to reference um, as you write your paper. And, and I want to make sure that everybody has these. The other thing that's not mentioned in these resources, but it is really important as you start doing qualitative research is to have a mentor who has done qualitative research. You need someone, um, you can read all the books in the world, but you're gonna need someone to talk to about the little questions that you have going forward. That person does not need to be within emergency medicine. They do not need to be in your field at all, but they need to have done some qualitative research so they can answer some of your questions. Um, and uh, here's yet another third page of, of resources for you, um, as well as our email addresses if we can help you. 
So why bother with qualitative research at all? So we've mentioned a couple of reasons, but this is our definition. We want everyone to be on the same page. So qualitative research is a scientific method of inquiry and observation that focuses on understanding phenomena in depth and detail, allowing for exploration without the constraints of a predetermined analysis plan and hypothesis. Um, and so uh, there's a great quote that says something uh, like, when people talk, they provide clear subtler and fuller explanations than quantitative data permits. And that's the idea. So if you're looking for understanding a phenomena or exploring something that's been sort of uncharacterized so far or an explanation of human behavior, um, then it really makes sense to start with qualitative research. So um, a good way to understand qualitative research is to compare it to quantitative because you have gone through medical school hearing about quantitative things and qualitative, quantitative studies. Um, and so understanding qualitative, you may, it may help you to look at the quantitative first. So what do we do with qualitative? What's the point? The point of qualitative is to understand and to explore. Whereas for quantitative, we're often trying to quantify something. We're trying to measure. We say, is there a difference? Is there an association? Is there a change in prevalence? What is the this? Is there a cause and their effect? Which are quantitative questions as opposed to the qualitative questions of understanding and exploring. We think about the hypothesis, qualitative research, we do not go in with a hypothesis. We want to understand and therefore generate hypotheses. So uh, it is often referred to as hypothesis generating as opposed to hypothesis testing. So you may talk to many people, learn a lot about what's going on, and then you create your hypothesis and that's your qualitative research and it informs your quantitative research. Quantitative research by definition is testing a hypothesis. What does our sample size look like in qualitative versus quantitative? Um, for a sample, for a qualitative study, it's going to be on the smaller side, and it's purposive or purposeful. You think to yourself, who do I need to talk to to make sure I'm really exploring this topic? If I talk to all women, would that be a problem? Do I need to make sure to include men? Um, if I talk to all um, ED nurses, am I missing a particular perspective or is that the, the singular perspective that I want? So it's a purposeful sample. Do I want to make sure I talk to early career and late career? Do I want to talk to patients from different backgrounds and communities? Um, whereas with many of our quantitative studies, we talk about having a large and representative sample. Your qualitative study doesn't necessarily have to be representative, but you want to think about who you're missing and what perspectives you might be missing if you don't um, uh, include all the people from, from different areas that you can sort of think of. What does your data look like? So as you know about quantitative studies, we have these measurable outcomes and data points. We have we really have to operationalize what are the data points that we're collecting. Whereas the data for qualitative is often observations, discussions, interviews, focus groups, and these open-ended, all this data. It's almost like your data is a sort of a conversation. What does the analysis look like? So the analysis for something quantitative is determined before you do the study. It's a priori and it's a statistical analysis. But for qualitative, your analysis is ongoing when you start these conversations with people and when you start gathering your data and you do this iterative coding of data, which means you do it again and again, you look back at person number one after you've read the transcript for person number 20, because you might get something more out of person number one now that you've heard what person 20 had to say. So then you're going to interpret what you hear and look at the different concepts and different relationships. And then what does rigor mean? So rigor is important in any research, right? And with quantitative data, we talk about reproducible and being free of bias. So you wanna do a study, you're gonna compare drug A and drug B. We wanna know that you did it in such a way that if I followed your methods at institution B and you did this at institution A, I should get similar results. It should be reproducible, it should be free of bias. So qualitative research recognizes that it's actually pretty difficult to be free of bias. We all come to everything we do with the bias of our own perspective. So we really want to recognize that bias and seek enough perspectives so that we can see where our bias is playing in. And that's where we sort of talk, start to talk about reflexivity and reflecting back on our what we brought to the table as well. We want to have multiple coders. If I read all the transcripts, I would bring my own bias to every single transcript. And if there was nobody else looking at all the transcripts, that would bring a lot of bias. We want to we talk about consensus. Do we does everyone on the team agree that this person is saying what we think they're saying? Triangulation is looking at something from a different angle, maybe from different perspectives. And then respondent validation is another way um, to ensure rigor, which is that you come up with your themes that you think you heard from this patient or, or this person or this participant, and you bring it back to them and say, This is what I heard. Is this what you said? <clears throat> 
Um, so a couple ways to think about whether you want to go for a qualitative or a quantitative approach. Think about how what the question is and how you phrase the question. So I'm going to give you a few examples of questions that may be better answered with qualitative versus quantitative. So if we had a question such as, um, does getting a script for Percocet increase the chance that someone will end up with substance use disorder? So that's a, an association or a cause and effect. And so maybe this is something that we need to look at some of these numbers. Whereas the qualitative um, iteration of something similar, like what are the barriers to patients with substance use disorder getting buprenorphine? This is something that we want to explore. We want to understand this phenomenon better. All right, why do doctors order CTAs for P before getting a D-dimer in low-risk patients? So we're not asking how many doctors do this or what proportion of doctors do this. We're just saying, why do doctors do this? Um, we, we know that there's a behavior, we want people to do this. Why are they not doing that? How often are CTs, uh, CTAs ordered in low-risk patients when a D-dimer is indicated by guidelines? Again, that's the quantitative question, that's the qualitative question. In my experience, how do you feel about chair decision-making? Does the use of shared decision making make a patient less likely to sue a doctor? So quantitative answers versus qualitative answers. I think for me, the thing that I really like about qualitative um, studies is that you really get an understanding that you wouldn't get from the quantitative stuff. You really get to sit down and you talk tonight. I use this picture because this is very sort of emblematic of patients that I've spoken to, to really get into what they're thinking and explore and ask questions um, and, and follow things through in a way that the quantitative data doesn't allow you to do. So whatever type of research you're interested in, it almost always will benefit from using qualitative methods. So for example, in implementation, we're trying to figure out how doctors change their behavior, providers change their behavior. We wanna implement something new or we wanna de-implement something that people are doing that they shouldn't be doing. We have a guideline, how do we get the doctors to follow it? What drives doctors' choices? Why is there variation? So asking those questions, getting an understanding of why things work the way they do is a, a qualitative requires qualitative inquiry. Comparative effectiveness, we think these things are equal or different. What, uh, what is going on in the background that sort of causes these things to happen? What are these underlying mechanisms? For randomized controlled trials, you think of these as very purely quantitative, um, but you actually really want to know what do the participants actually think about this intervention and how is that going to affect their efficacy and how is adherence going and what are the things that influence adherence? So there should be, um, uh, often for many of our randomized controlled trials, there should be a qualitative aspect because you really need to understand what's going on in the background. And then for education, how are the residents learning this? What do they think about this intervention? What are their experiences? How does it affect um, their training? Dr. Chisholm Straker. So there are a few types of uh, inquiry uh, in qualitative research. These are named by Creswell. These are five qualitative approaches to qualitative inquiry. Um, there are probably other names out there, but these are some of the most common that you'll find. So narrative research focuses on the life of an individual or a few individuals. So you might think of it as a documentary or an autobiography if you're thinking about something that's written. Phenomenological research or phenomenology focuses on the essence or the meaning of an experience, which um, Dr. Schoenfeld and I have been talking about um, in our work as examples, um, trying to understand what are the experiences of genderqueer folks in the emergency department? Why do clinicians or don't clinicians provide buprenorphine to patients with substance use disorders? Um, what makes us comfortable or not comfortable, that kind of thing. This is probably among the most common uh, of the approaches that we see in medicine and particularly in emergency medicine. Grounded theory research is the focusing of, it's the, the attempt to develop a theory that is rooted in data from the field. Um, so it's from the views of the participants. So you collect all this data and then you come up with a theory. I see the term grounded theory used a lot in what is actually phenomenological research um, because I think people aren't familiar. That's why you're you know, in having this session, right? Um, but unless you at the end have come up with a theory, you probably didn't do grounded theory research. You might've tried and, and couldn't. Um, and maybe that's a conversation we're talking about, but um, grounded theory is about developing a new theory that does not yet exist. Ethnographic research focuses on describing and interpreting a culture, um, a culture sharing group. So it involves observing and interviewing. Um, we don't see this a lot in emergency medicine, uh, potentially for obvious reasons. It takes months and years of being embedded in a community to do this kind of work. We see this a lot in sociology. Um, and so those of you who have studied sociology probably are more familiar with ethnographic research. And then case study research is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's, it focuses on an in-depth description and analysis of a case 
or of multiple cases. And we do see this a decent amount in medicine in general, where it's something that we don't see often, but it's important. So for example, when I was a medical resident, when I was a resident, um, I wrote a case study with um, my attending on a patient that had wet beriberi, right? We don't see it very often. And we all kind of know like thiamine, but that's all we really know, right? So it's helpful. It's a good refresher. And because there's a case attached to it, it makes the, the points more salient. So as we go through this, we're going to give you sort of um, an outline of how to think about this and how to start and, and how to get working on your qualitative study. So um, the first uh, thing to think about is obviously what is your question and is your question appropriate for qualitative research and how do you need to change that question, shift that question, make that question appropriate um, for the study that you're is going forward. Um, we're going to talk about what frameworks are or theory and how you use them. Um, that's actually a really important part of your qualitative research. So don't skimp on that. We're going to go through some methods, talk about sampling, analysis, and then discussion. So we'll get into these in a, a little bit more depth. So your question for qualitative research needs to be broad, right? You don't want to um, have any assumptions because that's the whole point is to get out of your own perspective. Um, so for example, I'm curious about the barriers and facilitators to shared decision-making. So it's just really, really broad. Um, and so I'm gonna ask questions about how do emergency physicians feel about shared decision-making? Um, I'm gonna talk about when and why they use it, when and why they don't use it, um, but I'm gonna try to keep this, it's just a very big, broad concept. Um, and the theoretical framework is gonna help me organize my question and also organize my interview questions um, and then do my analysis. And it basically gives me a big framework on which I'm gonna hang um, my entire broad scope of my question. And we're gonna go through a couple of theoretical frameworks that may work for you. Um, but if they don't, then you wanna go out there and you wanna search for a theoretical framework that might make sense for your question. So it's gonna help organize our question. It's gonna help people understand how we came to each step in the research plan. Um, it helps us see the, the big picture. Um, it's important to know that a, a perfect um, theoretical framework may not exist and that's okay um, and what you can do about that. Um, and then sometimes your research is actually about making a theoretical framework when you can't find one. And uh, that's um, what Dr. Chisholm Straker was talking about in terms of grounded theory. I have all this data. It does not at all fit in a theoretical framework that exists, I, but it does point to a framework that I would like to create that would help the, the field move forward. So here's the theoretical framework. Um, this is, uh, I think that um, ecological theory um, or social ecological theory. And so this is not appropriate for shared decision-making questions, but it may be very appropriate for talking about um, adherence and hypertension. What are the things that go on that have to do with people taking their antihypertensive meds or the risk of stroke or that, that sort of thing. So this may work for you depending on what your research question is. Here is the stages of precaution adoption process model. So this may work for um, quitting smoking. So um, I'm stage one, I didn't know that I needed to quit smoking. Stage two, I haven't really thought about it this much. Oh, I've heard that maybe I shouldn't. I've decided to act, I'm acting and then maintenance. So this may work for certain behaviors and it may not work for what you're talking about. So this is an integrative model of, um, of a couple of different theories. And what you'll notice about this one is that the final outcome that it's talking about all the way on the right is a behavior, um, but it's a general behavior. So whatever you're studying may or may not be a behavior and may fit in this. But for me, for shared decision-making, um, the decision to engage in shared decision-making can be seen as a behavior on the part of clinicians. So when I started looking for a theory to go with my first study about physicians' perspectives on shared decision-making, this made sense. And you look at this and you can sort of see how it might fit. What are the skills that the physicians needed to decide to engage in shared decision-making? Well, that's influenced by the attitudes. If they think that it's a waste of time, they're not going to do it, which is also influenced by all these other things. What are the norms, self-efficacy, all the things. So you can see that these things helped me understand what are the components of the questions that I'm going to ask about shared decision-making. Um, so let's talk a, a little bit about some of the methods that we can use to, to get our data. Um, and so observation is a method and there are some advantages. So when we observe people, we actually see reality um, and it's useful because we can see if people's behavior differs from how they report their behavior. We try to minimize the influence of the observer because we're not asking questions. But the problem is we're also not 
getting their perspective, we're only getting their behavior. Um, it can be time consuming. You may not be able to watch people um, and the observer cannot definitely influence behavior. And then just obs observation alone doesn't actually often give us enough context to know exactly what's going on. So depending on your question, this may work, this may not work individual interviews and I will be um, honest that this is my favorite and I'll tell you why. So this allows for discussion of sensitive top topics in a way that focus groups don't allow. So if you're going to ask questions that you think people may have something to say that is not the socially desirable answer, you need to ask them in um, an individual interview. This is also allows the most flexibility for so for par participants. So if you're asking something of your colleagues, of your patients, you need time from them to tell them to show up at 4 p.m. on Thursday is not the most flexible thing for them to do. It's much nicer on your part to meet them where they are, say when when works for you, let's go do it then. So this is definitely more time consuming for the uh, time consuming for the researcher, um, and you need to make sure that you you get a nice broad sample and a range of viewpoints. So that takes us to focus groups. Focus groups are very popular because you can get more input in less time. And then theoretically, they promote discussion and collaboration. So one person says one thing, someone else says, wow, that's really interesting. I would add this thing on. Um, in my experience, that doesn't always happen. Um, they can be logistically challenging to get everyone in the room at the same time. They're definitely not appropriate for anything that has sensitive topics. And you may not get quite as in depth because you'll get stuck at a superficial level that everyone's talking about and not necessarily get deeper. And then really for me, the most important thing is that the loudest voices are the ones that are heard and the quietest voices you may hear nothing from, in which case you do not get multiple viewpoints. You get the viewpoints of the two or three loudest people in the room. Um, so for many things, I think individual interviews are the way to go. And I also think that in this era of Zoom where people really understand Zoom and are uh, better at it, um, that does give you more options in terms of um, having these in a way that um, work in everyone's schedule. So what does your interview guide look like? So your interview guide is going to be based on that framework. And I put the framework down below that I used for a shared decision making. The other thing about the interview guide that's very different from other research you may have done is that it evolves. You start your interview guide, you draft it with what you think you want to ask, and then as you start asking the questions, you figure out better ways to ask the question. So um, you want to start with an open-ended question. Tell me about a time when you had to make a decision while working in the ED. So that's almost like too open-ended. You're like, oh my god, we make a million decisions. But there's no, there's nothing loaded in that question. I didn't say tell me about a time you used shared decision making. Just tell me about a decision that you made. Let's just get talking about this and then we'll get into some of the things I want. I also didn't say, why don't you use shared decision making more? Because that sets the interview off on a, um, on a direction where the person obviously knows that I think they should be using shared decision making more than they do. So after we start talking about decision making, then I sort of get into into, and sometimes they give an example where they use shared decision making and we go with that example. And then we get into, you know, can you tell me at a time when you use shared decision making and sort of walk me through what happened? Um, and then we get into attitudes, right? So how did you feel about that particular interaction? Did it have a positive or negative impact on the care the patient received? And again, positive or negative impact. I didn't ask whether it had a positive impact because you don't want to lead people. You really want people to feel free to give their answer. Can you share some scenarios where you did not involve the patient in decision making? Because we know that happens and we want to know a little bit why. Why are those scenarios different? Um, tell me why it didn't make sense to, to, to do so. And then you're going to ask questions and you're going to probe. And this is what makes it a semi-structured interview rather than a structured interview. A structured interview implies that you ask the same exact questions to every person every time. But this is semi-structured because when someone says something, you want to explore it and you want to be free to like move on to that next point. Um, in terms of logistical details, it's ideal to have more than one interviewer because the second interviewer can take notes and also can sort of be processing things and will ask questions that the first interviewer didn't really see. So I usually have one person doing the interviewing and the other person taking notes and asking questions at the end if something was missed. Ideally, you want to audio record, but again, this is going to depend on whether your participants are, are willing to be recorded. Um, you're going to want to transcribe the transcripts uh, or the, um, the recordings verbatim. And then you're going to want to have multiple coders, and I think the ideal number is three, and we'll talk about why, um, who are going to read each transcript and help you with the coding. All right, we're going to talk about the coding, which is also the, called the, the data analysis. Yeah, so there are many actually forms of analysis. Um, we're going to specifically focus on two that 
are probably most applicable to emergency medicine. Um, so thematic analysis, I think many of you have probably seen in some way uh, in the methods um, that term used. So thematic analysis is a way of identifying, analyzing, and then reporting about patterns uh, within the data. And those patterns are what we call themes. Um, you'll note that there's a lot of lingo uh, in, in, in all research really, but in, in learning to understand what qualitative research is, themes is just another word for patterns. And you wanna identify patterns or themes um, using judgment. So it's not about quantity. It's not that everyone said this or that uh, most people said this. When you get reviews back that ask you this um, for qualitative research, it's clear then that that reviewer is not familiar with qualitative research because what you're deciding is what is salient, what stood out to multiple coders, what stood out to the team um, as important. And then uh, as Dr. Schoenfeld had mentioned, something called uh, it, it, member checking or uh, when you actually go back to the respondents and say, you know, these are the themes that we saw based on what everyone has said. Does that, does that fit? Does that sit right with you? Does that sound right? Um, that's one way to check to see if the themes that you all thought were salient were actually what they were trying to communicate. Um, and that analysis can be driven by the data that's collected, so that's inductive, or based on existing theory, which we've touched on, or a little bit of both. Um, now, framework analysis, we often see uh, in applied policy research, um, and it's useful for a lot of things, uh, describing and interpreting occurrences in a particular setting, but also if you have a large data set. And we should sort of pause here to note that a lot of these interviews, um, focus groups, you're not actually, you know, talking to hundreds of people, generally speaking. Um, you might reach thematic saturation, which we'll talk about um, after 12, 15, 20 interviews, um, even smaller numbers sometimes, depending on if the, if the topic is so niche, it could be that six or eight is enough. It really just depends. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how you decide to analyze that. But framework analysis is particularly useful when you have thousands of, of points of data. Um, and then it's like, this is really like, it's, it's unseemly let's be honest, <laughs> to try to do thematic analysis at that level. Um, and with that, the rigor that's necessary and that's appropriate. Um, so the framework analysis may be more appropriate. Um, it is important to recognize that neither form is gonna take less time. Um, so time isn't really how we decide if we're gonna do one kind of analysis or another. It's what's appropriate for the data that we're collecting and the questions that we're asking. The analysis actually starts with the data collection. Um, this is very different from what we do in quantitative research, right? In quantitative research, we have a plan. Um, Dr. Schoenfeld talked about this, right? You have an a priori plan. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to analyze the data. And then once we have the data, we'll think about how we, and we'll, we'll actually have a plan for how we're going to interpret it also. But that's when you get into like the discussion part of your manuscript, right? But for qualitative analysis, the moment you start collecting data, that first interview is the beginning of your analysis, because that's when you figure, start to figure out, okay, well, we keep hearing this. We've heard this um, comment from, you know, multiple people. We haven't really, we're not really getting any more information that's new. That's when you've reached thematic saturation, um, when you start to not learn new things. So you need to get familiar with the content, right? So you are going to read the transcripts more than once, as Dr. Schoenfeld has already alluded to. Um, and you're going to therefore recognize common or meaningful threads. Um, you're going to see that the respondent one and respondent four and respondent seven said that. Um, and that's when things start to look like, oh, that's, or you might notice that uh, respondent three said a thing that everyone else was not saying as well or as cohesively. And that's when it became salient to your team. In order to recognize um, and identify these, these patterns, uh, you need a code book. And so a code is really just a label uh, uh, so that you can label threads. It's, ideally, it's not an entire paragraph, but threads, lines on a transcript, for example, of things that are common that you're seeing in various uh, responses from different respondents. Um, and even within a respondent, um, in, within one transcript, for example, they may be saying the same thing. So let's talk about what a code book looks like in a little bit. Um, but note that you're going to revise the code book. Um, and in order to 
in order in order for you to uh, be able to code the next transcripts, right? So you might get to transcript four and realize, wow, this person is saying something that we hadn't thought of that hadn't been coming up before. We need a way to code this. So your code book is actually iteratively revised. And at some point um, in the analysis, um, you do want to make sure that you are recognizing, naming, and accounting for a, a investigator bias. Uh, some journals, depending on the where you submit and the word uh, limit, you may not be able to include that, but it is a practice that I strongly believe in. Uh, it is super important. Um, and so we actually, in my practice, we journal um, as we're doing the, the analysis about this is what I'm bringing to this table. And then we talk about it collectively because that actually interprets it affects how you interpret what the themes are um, and what's salient and what's important. So here's an example of a code book. This is a code book that we used for uh, a study um, where we were examining the experiences of gender queer folks in the emergency department. So this is just a synopsis, but the code is the short word. It's just a phrase or a, a quick terminology that you're gonna use so that when you highlight something, you're saying, this is respect. What is respect? So you give it the definition. You could also have, a, have another column that has the short definition. Um, but so for example, here we have that respect is the dignified treatment that upholds the standards of care and or decency as expected by the patient, et cetera. Um, so, you know, we just looked it up online, right? But when do you use respect? So the code book tells you when this happens, when you read this, when you see this, this is when you apply it. Here's when you don't use it. It's very important to offer an example of when not to use it. And if you can offer another time that you would, another code that you would use. So here we see when the respondent reports confusion or concerns about an exam's necessity, use inappropriate instead. So inappropriate is a separate code. And then it's super helpful to give examples. So as you can see, the code book relies on you having data, right? So you can start the scaffolding of a, of a code book, but you can't really build the code book without the data. So you wanna have some examples so that anyone else going through your code book, other um, coders on your team, or even another uh, outsider investigator could look at your code book and say, oh, okay, I see how you would use it. I would code this that way too. And so that you might be actually coding the same, the same things the same way, um, which is where Dr. Schoenfeld had been talking about um, congruence. So there are a few different software platforms that now exist for you to engage in qualitative research across teams. And so here are just some examples of, um, I, I wanna talk about a few examples of software, but here we see on the side, um, legal, witness, unspecified threat, domestic, sexual, physical, and emotional. So here we see that these are the code names, and this tells us actually where those codes are applied. There are lots of different software platforms. Some of the ones that you may have heard of are in Vivo, Atlas TI, Deduce. To be frank, you don't need any software at all. You could do this by hand. The, I think, most useful thing about uh, software platforms is that it makes things searchable. So I want to be clear that searchable is not because that's how you're coding. You're not going to do control F and find respect and then highlight that and say, this is respect, and now we have a theme. But if you're like, oh, I remember somewhere on this transcript, they said something about this, and I want to find that again, you can do control find, find that thing, and then read that again and figure out what it should actually be coded. Um, the software platforms also let you see where there's overlap. So you can see if legal and unspecified threat actually appear the most commonly, that might be an interesting finding um, in your data, depending on what uh, your question is, or if that wasn't even your question, but like now you realize there's something new there or something interesting. Um, but it also depends um, to, on funding available, right? So a lot of these platforms are not free um, and some of them cost more than others. So if you're getting a platform that is expensive, you may only be able to afford it within your institution. Um, so that can be tricky. Um, if we could go to the next slide, I think. Yeah. Um, so here we see another example. Oh, sorry, you can go back. <laughs> so here we see another example um, of why a platform might be helpful. So we see the reason for why someone coded something. So you can actually have a conversation. It helps sort of facilitate that reconciliation of the codes where you then agree, okay, I see why you did that. No, I was wrong. I used that code wrong. Um, so that is one reason that I find the platforms can be helpful. Sorry, now next slide, thanks. Um, so Deduce is another platform that is, I would say more affordable, especially if you don't have a ton of grant funding or any grant funding at all. Um, and it's also useful outside of institutions. So I find it may be helpful when you're working with community members um, at community-based organizations 
or not, um, or at other institutions, deduce is something that um, one person at an institution can purchase, um, potentially under a grant, and then that membership can be extended to a certain number of people at a time. Um, and it works very similarly. Um, you do have to learn all the idiosyncrasies of each platform, but you can also do this by hand, right? So sometimes I just do this on, you know, Keynote, Word, Excel, whatever you put your transcripts into, because I can build a code book. You saw what the code book looks like. For the code, I just make respect the color blue, and then I highlight things blue. Um, so you can do a lot of these things you know, without a platform. You can also do it truly the old fashioned way by hand, but you know, then you get to worry about har harming trees. So, um, but that's the old school way that we used to do it. So then we did talk about, you know, themes is just another fancy word for pattern. Um, so you need to identify those themes and you do that collectively. You recognize thematic saturation where you say, okay, this is the third interview that we've had and we've, that we've heard no new data. We haven't really heard anything new. You might, you want to, once you reach thematic saturation, you want to go a little past that just to make sure you're not missing something. And then you can actually stop data collection, which is different from quantitative, where we say our N for this power, for example, needs to be this, and then we will stop. So here's an example of us using a conceptual framework. Interestingly, um, Dr. Schoenfeld had talked about, you know, you might not find a framework that works for you perfectly. Um, we actually combined two uh, frameworks to do our study uh, when we were examining uh, trans and gender queer experiences in the emergency department. And again, this happens at the outset. This is not after you've done your study and how you're going to write it up with your manuscript, you find a, a framework. It's at the beginning when you first ask your question, how do we conceptualize this issue? Has anyone else thought about this or are there other frameworks that are already out there that we can use to then think about how we're going to build our questions. Um, and so this was the one that we came up with that was actually based on stigma theory and social cognitive theory. So it does require, this is why it's really helpful to have a mentor because you may not even be familiar with where to look to find theories and frameworks. And now how do you display your data? So you've, and you, you want to show your, your conceptual framework like we did there uh, in the last slide, that one was included in, in our manuscript, but then your data isn't quite like it is in quantitative uh, research, you're not generally showing numbers. You can have a demographic table of these are the, uh, this is the race, ethnicity, um, gender, uh, age range, et cetera, of the, the people that we were able to speak with. Um, but a data display is one way that we may describe or share the information that we found. Um, so the way that we built our data display for this particular, um, study, we wanted to be able to offer for each code as much as possible positive and negative interpretations. Uh, so the conceptual frame comes from the framework, right? And that where that code then belongs, belongs under a frame. So all the codes should fall under a conceptual frame. And then competency was this code, right? And there were positive interpretations and negative interpretations. You'll see though, for some codes like inappropriate, there really isn't a positive spin on inappropriate. So we wanted to minimize how many of those we had. Um, and you provide a little summary uh, of your findings. So, and then you wanna offer an illustrative quote that comes from the actual transcript, the actual data. And while you do wanna make sure that the data remain, the participants remain protected, you want to make it clear, like this isn't all coming from the same respondent. So we have data from respondent 134, respondent 86, respondent 155, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is why it's super important as you're going through, you want to make sure you keep your numbers, <laughs> keep paying attention to those numbers. This was a, um, a survey. So we were able to get a few hundred folks participating, but it is, it is, a, it is burdensome. It is a lot. Um, if you're going to do a uh, hundred plus surveys, um, that's a lot of open-ended stuff to read, right? Um, and then, you, of course, you have to think about those limitations, right? So that's only going to be for folks who are literate or who have someone who can help them fill that out and literate in which languages. Uh, here's another way that we shared our data, which is we had these codes that fell within under, under these frameworks, under this conceptual frame of the framework that we shared at the beginning, and that led us to these themes. So you see here, sometimes it seems really obvious and simple, right? Like you don't have to come up with amazing fancy names either. Um, you want the name of the themes to actually be pretty self-explanatory to make sense so that the reader understands, oh, they're gonna talk about power and equity now. Um, so we saw that all of these codes fell under these three conceptual frames and led us to, to 
seeing this, this theme of power inequity. Um, and it's sort of, it all very, it happens all very organically. And in this scenario, it was, we, we came up with this collectively. So this wasn't like one person was like, oh, I'm a genius, I've solved it. Um, it we came up with this collectively and that's kind of the beauty of qualitative analysis. And that's why it's so intensive. It takes a long time. So here are a few quotes um, from that particular study. And then I'll talk about why I think these quotes are important overall for qual. So one respondent said, the doctor was unable to consider that my female history and male hormones could impact my health in the situation presented. Another said, the nurses said things like how it was against God and just wasn't right. And uh, this last respondent said, I've also had doctors and nurses call over other people on duty to come look at me for no reason. It made me feel like an animal in a zoo. You can't get that, quine, that kind of information viscerally from quantitative data. Um, so part of it is you want to understand, okay, well, how often does that happen? Um, how often do clinicians call over other folks? That might lead you to a quantitative study. But how does that make someone feel? It tells you a lot more about why that behavior probably is not appropriate. Um, besides, it's just like, not appropriate. Um, it actually really harms the relationship that we have with clinicians and uh, our and patients. You can't get this kind of information any other way besides asking and listening. And then there's some other lessons that Dr. Schoenfeld, I think, you'll share with us. Sorry for the delay. Yeah, so I completely agree. And I think that the, the first sort of lesson that we, um, that I would want to um, really help people see that qualitative helps you with is that, you know, we all go into research with sort of almost a degree of hubris, right? We study things that we think are important. And sometimes we have a theory and we want to prove that we're right. Um, but you really need to get out of your own perspective if you want your research to be successful. You really have to understand what are other people's perspectives of this issue because your own perspective is just you've got blinders on if you're not paying attention. And so doing qualitative research really allows you to put get rid of your blinders, listen to other people with a degree of depth um, that you don't necessarily do if you're not doing qualitative research and really hear things that you wouldn't have necessarily heard. You're gonna identify issues that you haven't thought of. These are often referred to as emergent themes. So a very simple example is that when we were interviewing attendings about their use of shared decision-making, we started to see this really tiny little thing about how shared decision-making worked with residents. And we decided because we were coding um, the transcripts as they came in and we had more interviews to do, we were able to then ask the rest of the interviewees a little bit more directly about their experiences with shared decision making with residents, which was not part of the original interview guide. Um, and what we found was uh, people gave us a bunch of feedback about why they usually did not use shared decision making with residents. And that has substantial implications for resident education and became an entirely other paper to help inform um, and further interventions to help inform how we train residents. Not at all what we intended to do, but there was this emergent theme that we then realized was important that we would not have heard if we hadn't sort of asked these broad open-ended questions. Um, so as that example demonstrates, we identified areas for future research as well as future interventions that we sort of didn't realize were, were going to be there. Um, and we really were able to hear people in a way that you are not able to hear them um, when you're just collecting quant uh, quantitative data. Um, so here are our email addresses. So the things that you're gonna think about as you start this process is these are sort of the big areas where you need to make sure you do a little bit of investing of your time and figure out how you're gonna do these things. We mentioned in the beginning, the importance of finding a mentor. Um, I would also say there's the importance of finding a checklist. So there's a co-rec checklist that's mentioned um, in some of the first slides. Um, and many of the journals will require that you actually submit that checklist um, with your paper when you submit it. So much better to know and understand that checklist before you do your study than try to retrofit your study to the checklist as it exists. Um, now, I think that is all I have. Dr. Chisholm Stranger, what else would you like to add? Um, I think that the most important thing I can stress is that qualitative research takes time and please be patient um, with yourself, with your team um, and recognize that this this takes longer than you think it does. 
every time I, <laughs> I've been, I, I do it quite a bit and it always takes longer than you think it does. Um, so, and that's okay. That's the right way to go about it. Um, yeah, just take your time. And again, a mentor, um, because you don't know what you don't know. None of us do. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great point. Well, thank you so much for joining us um, and feel free to reach out to us if you have more questions. Okay, well, thank you, Drs. Uh, Schoenfeld and Chisholm Straker for this very informative presentation. And thank you to everyone watching this presentation for the SAM Research Learning Series titled, How Qualitative Methods Can Help You Succeed in Research. Have a great day.